section thirty five of the interpretation of dreams this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by cynthia moyer the interpretation of dreams by sigmund freud translated by a a brill section thirty five absurd dreams intellectual performances in dreams part two i have to show that yet another dream in which my ego does not appear is none the less egoistic in chapter five d i referred to a short dream in which professor m says my son the myopic and i stated that this was only a preliminary dream preceding another in which i play a part here is the main dream previously omitted which challenges us to explain its absurd and unintelligible word formation on account of something or other that is happening in rome it is necessary for the children to flee and this they do the scene is then laid before a gate a double gate in the ancient style the porta romana in siena as i realize while i am dreaming i am sitting on the edge of a well and i am greatly depressed i am almost weeping a woman a nurse a nun brings out the two boys and hands them over to their father who is not myself the elder is distinctly my eldest son but i do not see the face of the other boy the woman asks the eldest boy for a parting kiss she is remarkable for a red nose the boy refuses her the kiss but says to her extending her his hand in parting auf gezeres and to both of us or to one of us auf ungezeres i have the idea that this indicates a preference this dream is built upon a tangle of thoughts induced by a play i saw at the theatre called das neue ghetto the new ghetto the jewish question anxiety as to the future of my children who cannot be given a fatherland anxiety as to educating them so that they may enjoy the privileges of citizens all these features may easily be recognized in the accompanying dream thoughts by the waters of babylon we sat down and wept siena like rome is famous for its beautiful fountains in the dream i have to find some sort of substitute for rome confer chapter five b from among localities which are known to me near the porta romana of siena we saw a large brightly lit building which we learned was the manicomio the insane asylum shortly before the dream i had heard that a co-religionist had been forced to resign a position which he had secured with great effort in a state asylum our interest is aroused by the speech auf gezeres where one might expect from the situation continued throughout the dream auf wiedersehen au revoir and by its quite meaningless antithesis auf ungezeres un is a prefix meaning not according to information received from hebrew scholars gezeres is a genuine hebrew word derived from the verb goiser and may best be rendered by ordained sufferings fated disaster from its employment in the jewish jargon one would take it to mean wailing and lamentation ungezeres is a coinage of my own and is the first to attract my attention but for the present it baffles me the little observation at the end of the dream that ungezeres indicates an advantage over gezeres opens the way to the associations and therewith to understanding this relation holds good in the case of caviar 
the unsalted kind is more highly prized than the salted caviar to the general noble passions herein lies concealed a jesting allusion to a member of my household of whom i hope for she is younger than i that she will watch over the future of my children this too agrees with the fact that another member of my household our worthy nurse is clearly indicated by the nurse or nun of the dream but a connecting link is wanting between the pair salted unsalted and gezeris ungezeris this is to be found in gezaot and ungezaot leavened and unleavened in their flight or exodus from egypt the children of israel had not time to allow their dough to become leavened and in commemoration of this event they eat unleavened bread at passover to this day here too i can find room for the sudden association which occurred to me in this part of the analysis i remembered how we my friend from berlin and myself had strolled about the streets of breslau a city which was strange to us during the last days of easter a little girl asked me the way to a certain street i had to tell her that i did not know it i then remarked to my friend i hope that later on in life the child will show more perspicacity in selecting the persons whom she allows to direct her shortly afterwards a sign caught my eye dr herod consulting hours i said to myself i hope this colleague does not happen to be a children's specialist meanwhile my friend had been developing his views on the biological significance of bilateral symmetry and had begun a sentence with the words if we had only one eye in the middle of the forehead like cyclops this leads us to the speech of the professor in the preliminary dream my son the myopic and now i have been led to the chief source for gezeris many years ago when this son of professor ems who is to-day an independent thinker was still sitting on his school bench he contracted an affection of the eye which according to the doctor gave some cause for anxiety he expressed the opinion that so long as it was confined to one eye it was of no great significance but that if it should extend to the other eye it would be serious the affection subsided in the one eye without leaving any ill effects shortly afterwards however the same symptoms did actually appear in the other eye the boy's terrified mother immediately summoned the physician to her distant home in the country but the doctor was now of a different opinion took the other side what sort of gazeris is this you are making he asked the mother impatiently if one side got well the other will too and so it turned out and now as to the connection between this and myself and my family the school bench upon which professor m's son learned his first lessons has become the property of my eldest son it was given to him by the boy's mother and it is into his mouth that i put the words of farewell in the dream one of the wishes that may be connected with this transference may now be readily guessed this school bench is intended by its construction to guard the child from becoming short-sighted and one-sided hence myopia and behind it the cyclops and the discussion about bilateralism the fear of one-sidedness has a twofold significance it might mean not only physical one-sidedness but intellectual one-sidedness also does it not seem as though the scene in the dream with all its craziness were contradicting precisely this anxiety when on the one hand the boy has spoken his words of farewell on the other hand he calls out the very opposite as though to establish an equilibrium 
he is acting as it were in obedience to bilateral symmetry thus a dream frequently has the profoundest meaning in the places where it seems most absurd in all ages those who have had something to say and have been unable to say it without danger to themselves have gladly donned the cap and bells he for whom the forbidden saying was intended was more likely to tolerate it if he was able to laugh at it and to flatter himself with the comment that what he disliked was obviously absurd dreams behave in real life as does the prince in the play who is obliged to pretend to be a madman and hence we may say of dreams what hamlet said of himself substituting an unintelligible jest for the actual truth i am but mad north northwest when the wind is southerly i know a hawk from a handsaw this dream furnishes a good example in support of the universally valid doctrine that dreams of the same night even though they are separated in the memory spring from the same thought material the dream situation in which i am rescuing my children from the city of rome moreover is distorted by a reference back to an episode of my childhood the meaning is that i envy certain relatives who years ago had occasion to transplant their children to the soil of another country thus my solution of the problem of absurdity in dreams is that the dream thoughts are never absurd at least not those of the dreams of sane persons and that the dream work produces absurd dreams and dreams with individually absurd elements when the dream thoughts contain criticism ridicule and derision which have to be given expression my next concern is to show that the dream work is exhausted by the cooperation of the three factors enumerated and of a fourth which has still to be mentioned that it does no more than translate the dream thoughts observing the four conditions prescribed and that the question whether the mind goes to work in dreams with all its intellectual faculties or with only part of them is wrongly stated and does not meet the actual state of affairs but since there are plenty of dreams in which judgments are passed criticisms made and facts recognized in which astonishment at some individual element of the dream appears and explanations are attempted and arguments adduced i must meet the objections deriving from these occurrences by the citation of selected examples my answer is as follows everything in dreams which occurs as the apparent functioning of the critical faculty is to be regarded not as the intellectual performance of the dream work but as belonging to the substance of the dream thoughts and it has found its way from these as a completed structure into the manifest dream content i may go even farther than this i may even say that the judgments which are passed upon the dream as it is remembered after waking and the feelings which are aroused by the reproduction of the dream belong largely to the latent dream content and must be fitted into place in the interpretation of the dream one one striking example of this has already been given a female patient does not wish to relate her dream because it was too vague she saw a person in the dream and does not know whether it was her husband or her father then follows a second dream fragment in which there occurs a manure pail with which the following reminiscence is associated as a young housewife she once declared jestingly in the presence of a young male relative who frequented the house that her next business would be to procure a new manure pail next morning one was sent to her but it was filled with lilies of the valley 
this part of the dream served to represent the phrase, not grown on my own manure. If we complete the analysis, we find in the dream thoughts the after-effect of a story heard in youth, namely, that a girl had given birth to a child, and that it was not clear who was the father. The dream representation here overlaps into the waking thought, and allows one of the elements of the dream thoughts to be represented by a judgment, formed in the waking state, of the whole dream. 2. A similar case. One of my patients has a dream which strikes him as being an interesting one, for he says to himself, immediately after waking, I must tell that to the doctor. The dream is analyzed and shows the most distinct allusion to an affair in which he had become involved during the treatment, and of which he had decided to tell me nothing. 3. Here is a third example from my own experience. I go to the hospital with P through a neighborhood in which there are houses and gardens. Thereupon I have an idea that I have already seen this locality several times in my dreams. I do not know my way very well. P shows me a way which leads round a corner to a restaurant, indoor. Here I ask for Frau Doni, and I hear that she is living at the back of the house in a small room with three children. I go there, and on the way I meet an undefined person with my two little girls. After I have been with them for a while, I take them with me, a sort of reproach against my wife for having left them there. On waking, I am conscious of a great satisfaction whose motive seems to be the fact that I shall now learn from the analysis what is meant by, I have already dreamed of this. But the analysis of the dream tells me nothing about this. It shows me only that the satisfaction belongs to the latent dream content, and not to a judgment of the dream. It is satisfaction concerning the fact that I have had children by my marriage. P's path through life, and my own, ran parallel for a time. Now he has outstripped me both socially and financially but his marriage has remained childless. Of this, the two occasions of the dream give proof on complete analysis. On the previous day, I had read in the newspaper the obituary notice of a certain Frau Donna A. Blank y, which I turn into Doni, who had died in childbirth. I was told by my wife that the dead woman had been nursed by the same midwife whom she herself had employed at the birth of our two youngest boys. The name Donna had caught my attention, for I had recently met with it for the first time in an English novel. The other occasion for the dream may be found in the date on which it was dreamed. This was the night before the birthday of my eldest boy, who, it seems, is poetically gifted. 4. The same satisfaction remained with me after waking from the absurd dream that my father, after his death, had played a political role among the Magyars. It is motivated by the persistence of the feeling which accompanied the last sentence of the dream. I remember that on his deathbed he looked so like Garibaldi and I am glad that it has really come true, followed by a forgotten continuation. I can now supply from the analysis what should fill this gap. It is the mention of my second boy, to whom I have given the baptismal name of an eminent historical personage who attracted me greatly during my boyhood, especially during my stay in England. I had to wait for a year before I could fulfill my intention of using this name if the next child should be a son, and with great satisfaction I greeted him by this name as soon as he was born. 
it is easy to see how the father's suppressed desire for greatness is in his thoughts transferred to his children one is inclined to believe that this is one of the ways by which the suppression of this desire which becomes necessary in the course of life is effected the little fellow won his right to inclusion in the text of this dream by virtue of the fact that the same accident that of soiling his clothes quite pardonable in either a child or in a dying person had occurred to him compare with this the allusion stuhlrichter presiding judge and the wish of the dream to stand before one's children great and undefiled five if i should now have to look for examples of judgments or expressions of opinion which remain in the dream itself and are not continued in or transferred to our waking thoughts my task would be greatly facilitated were i to take my examples from dreams which have already been cited for other purposes the dream of goethe's attack on herr m appears to contain quite a number of acts of judgment i try to elucidate the temporal relations a little as they seem improbable to me does not this look like a critical impulse directed against the nonsensical idea that goethe should have made a literary attack upon a young man of my acquaintance it seems plausible to me that he was eighteen years old that sounds quite like the result of a calculation though a silly one and the i do not know exactly what is the date of the present year would be an example of uncertainty or doubt in dreams but i know from analysis that these acts of judgment which seem to have been performed in the dream for the first time admit of a different construction in the light of which they become indispensable for interpreting the dream while at the same time all absurdity is avoided with the sentence i try to elucidate the temporal relations a little i put myself in the place of my friend who is actually trying to elucidate the temporal relations of life the sentence then loses its significance as a judgment which objects to the nonsense of the previous sentences the interposition which seems improbable to me belongs to the following it seems plausible to me with almost these identical words i replied to the lady who told me of her brother's illness it seems improbable to me that the cry of nature nature was in any way connected with goethe it seems much more plausible to me that it has the sexual significance which is known to you in this case it is true a judgment was expressed but in reality not in a dream and on an occasion which is remembered and utilized by the dream thoughts the dream content appropriates this judgment like any other fragment of the dream thoughts the number eighteen with which the judgment in the dream is meaninglessly connected still retains a trace of the context from which the real judgment was taken lastly the i do not know exactly what is the date of the present year is intended for no other purpose than that of my identification with the paralytic in examining whom this particular fact was established in the solution of these apparent acts of judgment in dreams it will be well to keep in mind the above-mentioned rule of interpretation which tells us that we must disregard the coherence which is established in the dream between its constituent parts as an unessential phenomenon and that every dream element must be taken separately and traced back to its source the dream is a compound which for the purposes of investigation must be broken up into its elements on the other hand we become alive to the fact that there is a psychic force which expresses itself in our dreams 
and establishes this apparent coherence that is the material obtained by the dream work undergoes a secondary elaboration here we have the manifestations of that psychic force which we shall presently take into consideration as the fourth of the factors which cooperate in dream formation six let us now look for other examples of acts of judgment in the dreams which have already been cited in the absurd dream about the communication from the town council i ask the question you married soon after i reckon that i was born in eighteen fifty six which seems to me to be directly afterwards this certainly takes the form of an inference my father married shortly after his attack in the year eighteen fifty one i am the eldest son born in eighteen fifty six so this is correct we know that this inference has in fact been falsified by the wish fulfillment and that the sentence which dominates the dream thoughts is as follows four or five years that is no time at all that need not be counted but every part of this chain of reasoning may be seen to be otherwise determined from the dream thoughts as regards both its content and its form it is the patient of whose patience my colleague complains who intends to marry immediately the treatment is ended the manner in which i converse with my father in this dream reminds me of an examination or cross-examination and thus of a university professor who was in the habit of compiling a complete docket of personal data when entering his pupils names you were born when eighteen fifty six patre then the applicant gave the latin form of the baptismal name of the father and we students assumed that the hofrat drew inferences from the father's name which the baptismal name of the candidate would not always have justified hence the drawing of inferences in the dream would be merely the repetition of the drawing of inferences which appears as a scrap of material in the dream thoughts from this we learn something new if an inference occurs in the dream content it assuredly comes from the dream thoughts but it may be contained in these as a fragment of remembered material or it may serve as the logical connective of a series of dream thoughts in any case an inference in the dream represents an inference taken from the dream thoughts it will be well to continue the analysis of this dream at this point with the inquisition of the professor is associated the recollection of an index in my time published in latin of the university students and further the recollection of my own course of study the five years allowed for the study of medicine were as usual too little for me i worked unconcernedly for some years longer my acquaintances regarded me as a loafer and doubted whether i should get through then suddenly i decided to take my examinations and i got through in spite of the postponement a fresh confirmation of the dream thoughts with which i defiantly meet my critics even though you won't believe it because i am taking my time i shall reach the conclusion german schluss equals end conclusion inference it has often happened like that in its introductory portion this dream contains several sentences which we can hardly deny are of the nature of an argument and this argument is not at all absurd it might just as well occur in my waking thoughts in my dream i make fun of the communication from the town council for in the first place i was not yet born in eighteen fifty one and in the second place my father to whom it might refer is already dead not only is each of these statements perfectly correct in itself 
but they are the very arguments that I should employ if I received such a communication. We know from the foregoing analysis that this dream has sprung from the soil of deeply embittered and scornful dream thoughts, and if we may also assume that the motive of the censorship is a very powerful one, we shall understand that the dream thought has every occasion to create a flawless refutation of an unreasonable demand in accordance with the pattern contained in the dream thoughts but the analysis shows that in this case the dream work has not been required to make a free imitation but that material taken from the dream thoughts had to be employed for the purpose it is as though in an algebraic equation there should occur besides the figures plus and minus signs and symbols of powers and of roots and as though someone in copying this equation without understanding it should copy both the symbols and the figures and mix them all up together the two arguments may be traced to the following material it is painful to me to think that many of the hypotheses upon which i base my psychological solution of the psychoneuroses which will arouse skepticism and ridicule when they first become known for instance i shall have to assert that impressions of the second year of life and even the first leave an enduring trace upon the emotional life of subsequent neuropaths and that these impressions although greatly distorted and exaggerated by the memory may furnish the earliest and profoundest basis of a hysterical symptom patients to whom i explain this at a suitable moment are wont to parody my explanation by offering to search for reminiscences of the period when they were not yet born my disclosure of the unsuspected part played by the father in the earliest sexual impulses of female patients may well have a similar reception confer the discussion in chapter five d nevertheless it is my well-founded conviction that both doctrines are true in confirmation of this i recall certain examples in which the death of the father occurred when the child was very young and subsequent incidents otherwise inexplicable proved that the child had unconsciously reserved recollections of the person who had so early gone out of its life i know that both my assertions are based upon inferences whose validity will be attacked it is the doing of the wish fulfillment that precisely the material of those inferences which i fear will be contested should be utilized by the dream work for establishing incontestable conclusions seven in one dream which i have hitherto only touched upon astonishment at the subject emerging is distinctly expressed at the outset the elder brücke must have set me some task or other strangely enough it relates to the preparation of the lower part of my own body the pelvis and legs which i see before me as though in the dissecting room but without feeling the absence of part of my body and without a trace of horror louisa n is standing beside me and helps me in the work the pelvis is eviscerated now the upper now the lower aspect is visible and the two aspects are commingled large fleshy red tubercles are visible which even in the dream make me think of hemorrhoids also something lying over them had to be carefully picked off it looked like crumpled tinfoil then i was once more in possession of my legs and i made a journey through the city but i took a cab as i was tired to my astonishment the cab drove into the front door of a house which opened and allowed it to pass into a corridor which was broken off at the end and eventually led on into the open finally i wandered through changing landscapes with an alpine guide 
who carried my things. He carried me for some distance, out of consideration for my tired legs. The ground was swampy, we went along the edge. People were sitting on the ground, like red Indians or gypsies, among them a girl. Until then I had made my way along on the slippery ground, in constant astonishment that I was so well able to do so after making the preparation. At last we came to a small wooden house with an open window at one end. Here the guide set me down, and laid two planks which stood in readiness, on the window-sill so as to bridge the chasm which had to be crossed from the window. Now I grew really alarmed about my legs. Instead of the expected crossing, I saw two grown-up men lying upon wooden benches which were fixed on the walls of the hut, and something like two sleeping children next to them. As though not the planks but the children were intended to make the crossing possible. I awoke with terrified thoughts. Any one who has been duly impressed by the extensive nature of dream condensation will readily imagine what a number of pages the exhaustive analysis of this dream would fill. Fortunately for the context, I shall make this dream only the one example of astonishment in dreams, which makes its appearance in the parenthetical remark, strangely enough. Let us consider the occasion of the dream. It is a visit of this lady, Louisa N., who helps me with my work in the dream. She says, lend me something to read. I offer her She by Ryder Haggard, a strange book but full of hidden meaning, I try to explain, the eternal feminine, the immortality of our emotions. Here she interrupts me. I know that book already. Haven't you something of your own? No, my own immortal works are still unwritten. Well, when are you going to publish your so-called latest revelations, which you promised us even we should be able to read? she asks rather sarcastically. I now perceive that she is a mouthpiece for someone else, and I am silent. I think of the effort it cost me to make public even my work on dreams, in which I had to surrender so much of my own intimate nature. The best that you know you can't tell the boys. The preparation of my own body which I am ordered to make in my dream is thus the self-analysis involved in the communication of my dreams. The elder Brücke very properly finds a place here. In the first years of my scientific work it so happened that I neglected the publication of a certain discovery until his insistence forced me to publish it. But the further trains of thought proceeding from my conversation with Louisa N. go too deep to become conscious. They are sidetracked by way of the material which has been incidentally awakened in me by the mention of Ryder Haggard's She. The comment, strangely enough, applies to this book and to another by the same author, The Heart of the World, and numerous elements of the dream are taken from these two fantastic romances. The swampy ground over which the dreamer is carried, the chasm which has to be crossed by means of planks, come from she, the red Indians, the girl, and the wooden house from the heart of the world. In both novels a woman is the leader, and both treat of perilous wanderings. She has to do with an adventurous journey to an undiscovered country, a place almost untrodden by the foot of man. According to a note which I find in my record of the dream, the fatigue in my legs was a real sensation from those days. Probably a weary mood corresponded with this fatigue, and the doubting question, how much farther will my legs carry me? In she, the end of the adventure is that the heroine meets her death 
in the mysterious central fire instead of winning immortality for herself and for others some related anxiety has mistakably arisen in the dream thoughts the wooden house is assuredly also a coffin that is the grave but in representing this most unwished for of all thoughts by means of a wish fulfillment the dream work has achieved its masterpiece i was once in a grave but it was an empty etruscan grave near orvieto a narrow chamber with two stone benches on the walls upon which were lying the skeletons of two adults the interior of the wooden house in the dream looks exactly like this grave except that stone has been replaced by wood the dream seems to say if you must already sojourn in your grave let it be this etruscan grave and by means of this interpolation it transforms the most mournful expectation into one that is really to be desired unfortunately as we shall learn the dream is able to change into its opposite only the idea accompanying an affect but not always the affect itself hence i awake with thoughts of terror even after the idea that perhaps my children will achieve what has been denied to their father has forced its way to representation a fresh allusion to the strange romance in which the identity of a character is preserved through a series of generations covering two thousand years eight in the context of another dream there is a similar expression of astonishment at what is experienced in the dream this however is connected with such a striking far-fetched and almost intellectual attempt at explanation that if only on this account i should have to subject the whole dream to analysis even if it did not possess two other interesting features on the night of the eighteenth of july i was travelling on the southern railway and in my sleep i heard someone call out holtorn ten minutes i immediately think of holoturia of a natural history museum that here is a place where valiant men have vainly resisted the domination of their overlord yes the counter-reformation in austria as though it were a place in styria or the tyrol now i see indistinctly a small museum in which the relics of the acquisitions of these men are preserved i should like to leave the train but i hesitate to do so there are women with fruit on the platform they squat on the ground and in that position invitingly hold up their baskets i hesitated in doubt as to whether we have time but here we are still stationary i am suddenly in another compartment in which the leather and the seats are so narrow that one's spine directly touches the back i am surprised at this but i may have changed carriages while asleep several people among them an english brother and sister a row of books plainly on a shelf on the wall i see the wealth of nations and matter and motion by maxwell thick books bound in brown linen the man asks his sister about a book of schiller's whether she has forgotten it these books seem to belong now to me now to them at this point i wish to join in the conversation in order to confirm or support what is being said i wake sweating all over because all the windows are shut the train stops at marburg while writing down the dream a part of it occurs to me which my memory wished to pass over i tell the brother and sister in english referring to a certain book it is from but i correct myself it is by the man remarks to his sister he said it correctly the dream begins with the name of a station which seems to have almost waked me for this name which was marburg i substitute holtorn the fact that i heard marburg 
the first or perhaps the second time it was called out is proved by the mention of schiller in the dream he was born in marburg though not the sturian marburg now on this occasion although i was travelling first class i was doing so under very disagreeable circumstances the train was overcrowded in my compartment i had come upon a lady and gentleman who seemed very fine people and had not the good breeding or did not think it worth while to conceal their displeasure at my intrusion my polite greeting was not returned and although they were sitting side by side with their backs to the engine the woman before my eyes hastened to preempt the seat opposite her and next to the window with her umbrella the door was immediately closed and pointed remarks about the opening of windows were exchanged probably i was quickly recognized as a person hungry for fresh air it was a hot night and the atmosphere of the compartment closed on both sides was almost suffocating my experience as a traveller leads me to believe that such inconsiderate and overbearing conduct marks people who have paid for their tickets only partly or not at all when the conductor came round and i presented my dearly bought ticket the lady exclaimed haughtily and almost threateningly my husband has a pass she was an imposing-looking person with a discontented expression in age not far removed from the autumn of feminine beauty the man had no chance to say anything he sat there motionless i tried to sleep in my dream i take a terrible revenge on my disagreeable travelling companions no one would suspect what insults and humiliations are concealed behind the disjointed fragments of the first half of the dream after this need has been satisfied the second wish to exchange my compartment for another makes itself felt the dream changes its scene so often and without making the slightest objection to such changes that it would not have seemed at all remarkable had i at once from my memories replaced my travelling companions by more agreeable persons but here was a case where something or other opposes the change of scene and finds it necessary to explain it how did i suddenly get into another compartment i could not positively remember having changed carriages so there was only one explanation i must have left the carriage while asleep an unusual occurrence examples of which however are known to neuropathologists we know of persons who undertake railway journeys in a crepuscular state without betraying their abnormal condition by any sign whatever until at some stage of their journey they come to themselves and are surprised by the gap in their memory thus while i am still dreaming i declare my own case to be such a case of automatisme ambulatoire analysis permits of another solution the attempt at explanation which so surprises me if i am to attribute it to the dream work is not original but is copied from the neurosis of one of my patients i have already spoken in another chapter of a highly cultured and kindly man who began shortly after the death of his parents to accuse himself of murderous tendencies and who was distressed by the precautionary measures which he had to take to secure himself against these tendencies his was a case of severe obsessional ideas with full insight to begin with it was painful to him to walk through the streets as he was obsessed by the necessity of accounting for all the persons he met he had to know whither they had disappeared if one of them suddenly eluded his pursuing glance he was left with a feeling of distress and the idea that he might possibly have made away with the man behind this obsessive idea was concealed among other things a cane fantasy for 
all men are brothers owing to the impossibility of accomplishing this task he gave up going for walks and spent his life imprisoned within his four walls but reports of murders which had been committed in the world outside were constantly reaching his room by way of the newspapers and his conscience tormented him with the doubt that he might be the murderer for whom the police were looking the certainty that he had not left the house for weeks protected him for a time against these accusations until one day there dawned upon him the possibility that he might have left his house while in an unconscious state and might thus have committed the murder without knowing anything about it from that time onwards he locked his front door and gave the key to his old housekeeper strictly forbidding her to give it into his hands even if he demanded it this then is the origin of the attempted explanation that i may have changed carriages while in an unconscious state it has been taken into the dream ready-made from the material of the dream thoughts and is evidently intended to identify me with the person of my patient my memory of this patient was awakened by natural association my last night journey had been made a few weeks earlier in his company he was cured and we were going into the country together to his relatives who had sent for me as we had a compartment to ourselves we left all the windows open throughout the night and for as long as i remained awake we had a most interesting conversation i knew that hostile impulses towards his father in childhood in a sexual connection had been at the root of his illness by identifying myself with him i wanted to make an analogous confession to myself the second scene of the dream really resolves itself into a wanton fantasy to the effect that my two elderly travelling companions had acted so uncivilly towards me because my arrival on the scene had prevented them from exchanging kisses and embraces during the night as they had intended this fantasy however goes back to an early incident of my childhood when probably impelled by sexual curiosity i had intruded into my parents bedroom and was driven thence by my father's emphatic command i think it would be superfluous to multiply such examples they would all confirm what we have learned from those already cited namely that an act of judgment in a dream is merely the repetition of an original act of judgment in the dream thoughts in most cases it is an unsuitable repetition fitted into an inappropriate context occasionally however as in our last example it is so artfully applied that it may almost give one the impression of independent intellectual activity in the dream at this point we might turn our attention to that psychic activity which though it does not appear to cooperate constantly in the formation of dreams yet endeavors to fuse the dream elements of different origin into a flawless and significant whole we consider it necessary however first of all to consider the expressions of affect which appear in dreams and to compare these with the affects which analysis discovers in the dream thoughts End of section 35